Let's talk about direct distractions or, uh, um, well, let's just call them prevarications or terminological inexactitudes, as our friend Winston Churchill used to refer to liars. Uh, <laughs> clean coal. Clean, squeaky, shiny, let's eat off the stuff. It's delicious. It's good for us. It's good for us to breathe. Mercury is not really a problem. Have all the sulfur you can while you're at it, a little arsenic in your salad. Uh, this is nonsense if you're a mammal with cells that divide. This really isn't very healthy for us, is it? Indeed it's not. And really, there could be no greater fiction than the idea of clean coal. Um, you know, when you really parse what the, the coal industry likes to say, they try not to even refer to the contaminants uh, beyond uh, greenhouse gases from coal. They try to pretend that there's nothing like, as you say, mercury, which is, you know, a co-pollutant that comes out uh, with uh, greenhouse gases. They sort of ignore those things, and, and that's why there is no such thing as clean, clean coal. Um, the idea that we have low emissions coal is just utterly ridiculous. But the real, I think, sad time here at this conference of the parties, this climate negotiations here in Warsaw, is when we see really smart and sharp officials like Ms. Figueres take up that same rhetoric and simultaneously ignore the amazing efforts over the past decade of citizens groups, social movements to not just dream about the end of coal, but to take off the map almost 200 coal-fired power facilities just in the U.S. and begin to expand that effort around the world in India, in South Africa, in Europe. Um, so really citizens are taking up this um, effort to get rid of coal and to stop um, pretending that there's such a thing as clean coal. Citizens are helping promote and, and or prevent, rather I should say, truth decay as you like to say. And they're doing so in a bold and brilliant way by not just putting a kill on dirty 20th century coal, but really simultaneously opening up space for solar energy, for wind energy, for the positive renewable energies of the 21st century. And that's really the story that we have to keep telling. That's the story we have to tell as not just citizens groups do it, but as lawyers work with them, as other public health officials and experts work with those same groups, and as they all come together to get rid of that dead, dirty 20th century technology, coal. And Professor Dorsey, you're coming to us live right now from Poland, and you're here uh, watching and participating in a global gathering of people actually for real concerned about this. Uh, young folks concerned because stuck on this planet for another 60, 70, 80 years with all this coal, these new plants being built, uh, sometimes three a week in places like China. We sure want to up the deal here in the United States. Uh, if you're stuck here for another 50, 60, 70 years, this is kind of a grim tale. Like, recycling isn't a hobby, as it might be for Mildred in Ohio. People really mean it. This is life or death, huh? Well, it is life or death, but I don't know if the tale is so grim. Uh, really, the horizon of change is really upon us. And I think if anybody knows that, that's young people. Right now, in states like Texas, there are more people working in the solar and wind in industries in Texas than they are working in the, in cattle, right? The irony and, is and, delicious, and, and you must admit. It, it is indeed. <laughs> indeed, pun intended, I suppose. Uh, but even take a state like California. We, we, know, we think of California as the, the, the state of, of movie stars and, and fast cars and whatnot. But again, another state that's leading the way in growing jobs in the solar and wind uh, sectors. And right now we've got more jobs in those two sectors than we have uh, in acting and in Hollywood. So big changes are not just <laughs> coming, um, but they're upon us and they're going to take shape in really dynamic ways. Nobody imagined private funders, even some activists, thought it was a bad idea to try to put the kill on the coal industry, even five years ago and certainly 10 years ago, people said, no, don't try to do it. You're never going to be able to, to get rid of that industry. And what do we have now just in a, not even in a decade, we've got almost 200 coal-fired power plants offline. We've got literally um, 78, more than 78,000 tons of mercury cleaned out of the environment, not being polluted in the environment. That 78,000 tons, that's more than 15 full-size Chevy Trailblazers of lead. Imagine that, Harrison.
I that's the change. I actually coming. would prefer not to. I live in LA where I'm surrounded by exactly that quantity on a daily basis. I'm thinking maybe of a bicycle uh, or a skateboard, whatever is the most convenient. So actually, there's good news in all of this. We get tales of just endless cyclonic horrors out in the oceans. And we know these are real. We had just recently 50 torn 50 tornadoes throughout the Midwest. I was on an airplane and had to fly down to Alabama to get to Los Angeles. That was scary enough, I have to admit. And all of this stuff is real. It's probably going to continue to get more intense as time goes on. So do you see a reduction in foul weather, tragically foul weather, with the harder we work to reduce uh, the CO2 emissions? Or does it just keep getting worse no matter what we do? Well, if we don't take aggressive strides to reduce the increasing amount of greenhouse gases and carbon pollution in the atmosphere, the scientists are predicting with a great degree of certainty and accuracy that indeed catastrophic weather events will be on the rise. But we have a moment now where we can begin to take serious efforts, we can begin to take big, big efforts to reduce the growing carbon pollution in the atmosphere. And I'll tell you, it's a sad thing that our leaders, unfortunately, aren't driving that effort, that big, big effort that we need to get that carbon pollution out of the atmosphere. But the change, I think it is hopeful, and it's being led by citizens, it's being led by local movements, and one should never estimate the capacity and um, abilities of those individuals, small uh, in you know, small groups working together for these big, big changes. And because, like I said, we never thought we would see the death of the coal industry in the United States. We are on the eve of the end of the coal industry, and it hasn't wrecked the economy. It hasn't put people out of work. It has indeed prompted and promoted the growth of a new sector, the green economy, particularly in the solar and wind sector. So big, big changes are coming. They're going to make things better healthier, and they're going to be delivered by folks like your listeners. And Professor Dorsey, you worked with President Obama. You're part of the EPA. You've seen all of this. I, you know, would my fantasy with Detroit in a state of sort of endless, unimaginable decay, this massive, huge industrial city that brought so many people from the South during World War II that you couldn't just flip a switch and say, we have acres of factories, poof, tomorrow they make windmills. Everybody has a job again. I mean, there's some really logical end games here that would give everybody a job and save the world. Well, I'll tell you the poof that we've had. And again, this, this is why we can never underestimate the possibilities for change and dynamic change that need to lead to new and amazing things. The car industry now, the big three, they got out of that slump that uh, they were rescued from when President Obama came into office. Uh, for better or for worse. But right now, their their newest problem is that they're dealing with a generation of young uh, consumers that don't want to drive, that aren't driving, that are driving in very, very different ways that none of the big three were able to predict. Uh, young people are using social driving, as it were. They're, mm. they're investing in um, community cars and so forth. Zip and cars. We really, have them in L.A. now. Indeed. Who knew? And, radically changing yeah. the way people drive and that has good implications for the environment it has not so much downside implications for the big three but it's the kind of thing that's going to force them to change their business model and that'll have potentially at the way it's targeting and going now positive outcomes on the environment less driving less pollution uh social uh sharing of automobiles and so forth that doesn't put people on the streets and force them to bicycles, that changes the way we behave as a society, that changes the way we relate to one another, and it has upside consequences economically in creating new kinds of industries, in creating things like car sharing and Uber and, and social media networks, bringing cars to you in, in ways that previously were not really imaginable, but it has big positive environmental benefits. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today on The Smart Show, and thank you for being brave. Um, you, It's just part of your normal hardwiring to get out there and do this stuff, but it would really freak a lot of other people out to put themselves in your position and 
expose yourself, uh, the, the vulnerabilities, the people that might be against you in the coal industry, for instance. Um, so we need heroes, and we really admire and appreciate the fact that you're also a professor and that you can profess what you've learned so that we can well, all learn, and I'm very grateful for that. And thank you for uh, spending some time with us. Hope to connect with you down the road again and get some updates on a positive future. Uh, I'll be looking forward to that conversation, Harrison, and thank you for having me on. And I have to say, just before closing, that um, I'm inspired by the likes of young people, some of whom are my students. I'm inspired by the likes of the Philippine negotiator, a good friend, Yeb Sanyo, uh, who's come out really strong and taken the moral high ground in these negotiations. I'm inspired to be in the midst of these folks because uh, I think they are doing much more than I ever could, and I follow in their footsteps and, and in your footsteps, too, trying to prevent that truth decay. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And thank you for joining us live from Poland. And uh, get out there, put on your boxing gloves, and save the world, my friend. Thank you, sir. All right. Have a great day.